the MoneyWeb Crypto Podcast, where we discuss all things crypto related. Your host, Kieran Ryan. What are the chances of you losing your crypto? It's reckoned that up to 20% of all Bitcoin mined has been lost or stolen over the years. Many of them stored on hard drives that were thrown away at a time where Bitcoin was worth cents in the dollar or because of lost passwords, also theft and hacks. There's a whole industry dedicated to convincing you to hand over your Bitcoin with promises of unbelievable returns. 20% of Bitcoin's current market cap is about $240 billion. That's probably lost forever. One of the great advantages of traditional banking is you can usually recover your funds if you send it to the wrong account. That's not true in the crypto space because there are no intermediaries. There's no one to phone if the funds go missing. That was the great blessing of crypto, in fact, since these intermediaries come at a cost. Send crypto to the wrong address and you are on your own. Now, MoneyWeb was recently contacted by a reader who sent Ethereum to a US dollar stable coin address at Luno. The funds were lost and the reader wanted to know why Luno could not recover the funds. And we thought this would be an opportune time just to look at some of the hazards and difficulties of transferring crypto around wherever, between different accounts and between different exchanges. So we invited Christo de Witt, Luno's manager for South Africa, to help us delve into this. Christo, tell us what happened here and why Luno was unable to recover the funds for the customer. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. And yes, as you mentioned, unfortunately, one of our customers mistakenly sent Ethereum from a private wallet to the USDC wallet on Luno. Now, both of these cryptocurrencies operate on the ERC-20 network. Now, the ERC-20 is a standard on the Ethereum blockchain that ensures that all cryptocurrencies on the Ethereum blockchain can follow the same basic rules, making them compatible with wallets and decentralized applications. Now, however, just because these tokens both operate on the same network and have to comply with the same basic rules, it does not mean that the tokens and their associated wallets are interoperable. Imagine you are sending a package to a friend using a specific courier service. You know that your package, in this case, Ethereum, and other packages like USDC are handled by the same courier service. So it's easy to assume that you can send any package, in this case, Ethereum, to any address. Again, in this case, the USDC wallet. While both packages might be delivered by the same courier service, each type of package or token can only be delivered to a very specific address. Now, In this case, again, imagine the package is being delivered to a big company with many different departments. Each department has a specific address associated with it. In this case, the Ethereum needs to be sent to the Ethereum department and USDC to the USDC department. In the event that the package is sent to the wrong department, that department does not have the infrastructure to support the package being sent to the right department may not be able to handle or even read the label and is therefore not able to open the package. Thus, unfortunately, if you send Ethereum from a private wallet to a USDC wallet on your Luna account, the crypto becomes irretrievable as there is no interaction between these wallets, even though the send was facilitated by the ERC-20 network. Right. Now, I guess people should probably understand that uh, you're dealing with two completely different types of crypto, the one being Ethereum, the other one being a US dollar stable coin. And they have different accounts. So this is like you would have one account with NetBank, for example, and another account with Capitec. And uh, if you think that you can send your US dollars to a Capitec account, it may not be accepted. I mean, that's a bad analogy, but this is really what you're saying. Yeah, it's, and it's not just the account numbers, it's the actual uh, contents of the account, that the structure in which those coins are created, the, the, the fundamental coding behind it may not be legible by you know a different network or a different wallet in this instance, even though, not the network, but even though they were sent on the same network. So that's why customers must take very, very careful consideration when doing sends and receives of their cryptocurrency to make sure that they are sending it to an eligible wallet using the right wallet ID as well as sending it on the correct network. 
I suppose sticking with the banking analogy, this is what SWIFT is all about. I mean, that is the the language, the common language that banks use to transfer funds all over the world. You can argue that it's inefficient and it takes days and all that kind of thing, but it is a language that is understood by everybody. So if your funds transferred in that language will get to where they're going. You're pretty confident of that. Not so when it comes to crypto, correct? I mean, I think, you know, bringing the banking sector and the SWIFT network into a cryptocurrency discussion, you know, you can go into a lot of different directions with this. But if we use the SWIFT uh, analogy or, or, or the, the, the SWIFT example, I mean, Bank A has a customer who wants to send US dollars to Bank B um, in South African Rand. But that bank needs to go through an intermediary, which is the SWIFT network, which in turn may also have to go through various intermediaries in between to get that funds converted from US dollar to, uh, for instance, South African Rand. And that takes days. It is expensive. It is a slow process. This is where cryptocurrency is the solution, where crypto sends and receives are oftentimes instantaneous, much shorter. And if it's sent from, you know, the right wallet, so say, for instance, if you want to send Ethereum to an Ethereum, an Ethereum from an Ethereum account to an Ethereum wallet, that transaction is, is almost instantaneous, right? But the onus is always on the customer to ensure that they are utilizing the right information and sending it to the correct address. So by cutting out the middleman and the, the intermediary in this instance, doesn't mean that it makes the network less safe than, for instance, traditional banking or the SWIFT network. It just means that greater caution needs to be taken when dealing in these transactions. This, of course, is one of the great risks associated with transacting with crypto, the possibility of shipping it to the wrong address. And I'm sure this is something that's not new at Luna. So how do you help customers to prevent this from happening? I mean, absolutely. As, as we've discussed, there, there's a great deal of risk associated too um, with it, you know, as crypto transactions are irreversible. And like we've seen in this instant, mistakes can lead to permanent loss. Now, we've mentioned that unlike traditional bank, there's no central authority to recover the funds. And if you send your crypto to the wrong address or the wrong network, those funds will most likely be uh, recoverable. Now, at Luna, we've taken great care to introduce necessary checks to minimize these risks. On our website and help center, we provide comprehensive resources to educate customers about these risks. And more specifically in our apps, the necessary friction is added to the customer journey where we highlight relevant warnings during the wallet creation process. And we even disable crypto sends initially when wallets are created. This feature must be manually activated, and even then, when it is activated, a 24-hour waiting period is enforced to ensure that users are fully aware before making transactions. We've made significant effort to educate customers about the risks of sending cryptocurrency, as well as applying the relevant friction in the process to make sure customers are careful when they send cryptocurrency. That that does sound like it would be helpful. Uh, it gives the person 24 hours just to reflect and double check that he sent it to the right address and is this a valid transaction and so on. Talk for a minute about the trends that you're seeing in terms of lost or misdirected crypto. Is it getting better or worse or is this something that happens when we start to see transaction volumes pick up and the crypto market is frothy? You get more of this kind of activity going on or is this a, something that's declining over time? On Luna, we're not necessarily seeing any drastic shifts in in customers reaching out due to incorrect sends. However, as you mentioned, globally, as cryptocurrency is becoming more mainstream and more and more people are investing in crypto, there is a likelihood that this will increase. Uh, We have also noted that scammers and fraudsters have caught on and are using this to drive their scams. I recently read an article where a cryptocurrency trader lost nearly $70 million dollars in an address poisoning scam. Now, address poisoning scams are where scammers create fake accounts, mimicking the trader's crypto address. The trader was then tricked into sending the funds to the wrong address. This scam highlights the rising threat of crypto-related fraud, which I think the FBI estimated cost around or, or had the value of around $4 billion last year. 
Now, to avoid such scams, experts recommend always double-checking crypto addresses before sending funds and sending a small test transaction to first verify the address. Again, on Luno, we, we make it very clear to customers that to avoid sending crypto to the wrong address, it's crucial to follow these precautions. First, remember that a crypto wallet, a cryptocurrency wallet, is usually a lengthy combination of alphanumeric characters. So always copy and paste the address instead of typing it out. When possible, use QR codes to automatically fill in the recipient's address, but also double check all the details. And then ensure that you send the correct cryptocurrency to the associated wallet and verify that you are sending it on the correct network as well. Double check every step of the way to avoid mistakes. I'm interested in the crypto trader who lost $70 million because he was tricked into sending it to a, a different address that was obviously in the, belonging to the scammers. One would have thought that he would have sufficient experience to not fall for something like that. How does that come about? If you look into the address poisoning scam that, that fraudsters have caught on to, what they do is they send cryptocurrency to your address or to your wallet, uh, mimicking your wallet account. So there are slight changes in your wallet ID. And then what happens and what they hope would happen is many customers would not double check every single digit of that address and would just go back into their transaction history and reuse a wallet that was previously sent. So that customer in this instance fell victim or fell victim to this and then did not notice the difference between the wallet addresses because it are, these are such uh, lengthy alphanumeric codes. And in that way, the customer made a large transaction sending this cryptocurrency and therefore it got lost because he didn't double check, which is a significant loss to suffer. And I think in, in, in this day and age where, you know, not only in crypto, but in traditional finance, we see scammers and fraudsters on the rise, that customers should take the necessary steps to educate themselves about, uh, uh, you know, the, the intricacies of sending and receiving, but also on what crypto fraudsters could potentially latch onto to exploit them. There is a trend towards self-custody, partly because of it's seen as uh a way to mitigate risks if something happens on the exchange, if you leave your coins on the exchange. Now, that in itself, I'm talking about self-custody, is a, is a potential risk since the customer has to set up a wallet and make sure the crypto is sent to the correct address. Do you encourage self-custody at Luno, and how can you ensure people don't send to the wrong address? Yeah, Karen, in um, the crypto industry, there's a saying, not your keys, not your crypto, right? Which means if you're not the sole custodian of your cryptocurrency, it might not be truly yours. I mean, it seems very logical um, and it makes complete sense. But as with anything, there are risks on both sides. So if we look at the centralized exchanges, just looking back over the last 15 years, Many of them have failed to provide confidence that they can securely custody their investor funds, right? At Luno, we've, we've taken significant steps to ensure that we ensure customers' peace of mind. So as a regulated financial services provider overseen by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, we conduct voluntary monthly proof of reserve verifications to ensure that all of our crypto on platform is held one-to-one. -one. Um, what that means is, you know, we're not we're a non-fractional custodial exchange, meaning we don't use our customers' crypto for anything, and we keep it in safe custody. In other words, you're not you're not on lending your customers' crypto exactly. as some are doing. And also, this is where we are in in a direct contrast to the banking industry, right? Banks, you know, the the, the funds, you know, your salary that's deposited every month into the bank, um, that is being lent out, right? To to for the bank to obviously earn some yield on it. Whereas uh, Luno and and other centralized exchanges who follow the same model do not do that, right? Uh, non-fractional and every single uh, uh, cryptocurrency is held one-to-one -one in our in our custodial solution. On the other hand of the spectrum, if you choose self-custody, um, which, you know, could be in the form of a hardware wallet, which to many people would look like, you know, those old school USB drives. Um, you know, there are great companies out there that produce their hardware wallets. There are also significant risks involved um, to the point you made in the opening statement where 20% of, of, of the total Bitcoin created has been lost uh, or it's estimated to have been lost. Many of that is because the cryptocurrency was, was stored on, on hardware wallets 
those wallets became lost. People forgot their pins or the security codes, the, the keys. And I mean, this is a significant risk in, in, in keeping your, your cryptocurrency on a hardware wallet. When a customer considers where to custody their crypto, I think, again, you know, if you're going to invest a significant portion of your wealth, um, of your, your investment or savings into something like cryptocurrency, then the necessary checks and balances needs to be in place as well to do so with a provider that places their customer safety uh, and the safety of their assets as a primary objective um, is definitely a consideration. And if self-custody is a viable option, then to ensure that you have the necessary uh, uh, recourse in place to ensure that your hardware wallet is always retrievable um, and that you can always access the crypto on that hardware wallet. Yeah, I, I think uh, anybody in, in the crypto space has probably learned that uh, this sort of information, how you self-custody and how you set up a wallet, it's pretty simple. You, you can Google it. It sounds complicated, um, but it's, it's been simplified over the years to just a, you know, a few steps that can be done in minutes. Let's talk briefly about the state of the crypto markets. It's been a great year for Bitcoin, though prices have been stuck in a very tight range now for several months. Maybe just explain why that is. What's going on in the market? Yeah, I think, you know, Bitcoin and the, the broader crypto industry has had a stellar year, uh, you know, marked by absolutely unprecedented events. I think before we look at this this current holding pattern almost that, that we found ourselves in, if we look back to the beginning of the year, um, you know, in January, we had the long anticipated approval of the Bitcoin spot ETFs in the US. That led to a massive influx of institutional capital. Shortly after that was followed by the Bitcoin halving, which we know is a built in event within Bitcoin's algorithm that halves the reward for miners securing the network. This reduction in supply has historically been seen as a bullish indicator. And then in March, right? Bitcoin reached an all-time high against the US dollar. Closely following that, Ethereum ETFs were, were further were, were approved, which further boosted the confidence in the industry. Um, and globally, we can see the cryptocurrency is increasingly moving into a regulated space. South Africa, crypto is now classified as financial product. Luno, with other crypto asset service providers, gained their financial services provider license. Um, and interestingly enough, which, which you may have seen, is in the U.S. on um, the current campaign trail in the elections, cryptocurrency is also taking center stage, right, which then has its repercussions and impact on, um, uh, uh, on, on the industry and the price. What was interesting, though, is, is recently, about a week and a half back, um, you know, the U.S. job market report caused shockwaves across the global financial markets, you know, stock markets tank, you know, Bitcoin dropped significantly. But what is interesting to me is now a week and a half later, we can see that Bitcoin has recovered significantly since these shockwaves are coming in. So even though it's been quite of a, a muted few months in terms of the overall performance, you know, less volatility that we've seen over other periods of time, I think that that just shows that there is a level of resilience and trust um, being shown to Bitcoin and to the crypto industry. And I think that's why we've seen kind of this this period of uh, a muted volatility, if you will. Finally, Christo, I guess we could call this a bull market, although it's been fairly flat for the last few months. But it's certainly uh, trading in a, in a tight range, but at a higher range than was the case uh, last year and the year before. Are you finding that you are seeing greater volumes and more customer signups at a time like this? Uh, is it very much linked to the state of the markets? How many new people are jumping onto crypto and trading? Absolutely. I think, I think many different analysts or, or different analysts would view it differently um you know some analysts suggest we are in a pre-bull market some other analysts suggest that the bull market is already kind of over i think if we look at where the market is currently we've seen the momentum built in um and, and we see where it's going you know it's, it's still early days i think um there is still a lot of optimism but there's also a bunch a lot of external factors that influence not only crypto but but you know the traditional financial markets as well um if i look back historically at the previous bull markets and the previous cycles we've seen significant customer growth during these periods we see volume shoot through the roof 
um, as customers get excited about, you know, the prospect of making, you know, quick profits with the the excessive growth that that is 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 possible in in the crypto industry. What we like to look at is is Google Trends, right? And as soon as your Google Trends for for keywords like crypto or Bitcoin really starts to shoot through the roof, then we kind of know, okay, this is indicative of a bull market. And if you go and look on Google Trends at the moment, you'll see that the search history for just over the last few months for Bitcoin and for cryptocurrency is still relatively flat. So that to me suggests that, you know, the broader retail market is not yet caught on not yet too excited about the optimism and the recovery that we've seen in the crypto industry. And perhaps that then is, you know, signals that this bull market is still to come. And how many customers do you have now at Luna? I think the last time we spoke, it was 10 or 11 million. Has it gone up from that? Yeah. So currently globally, um, across all of our markets where we operate, uh, we have 13 million uh, customers um, on, on Luna using Luna platform. Um, and in South Africa, you know, we're sitting at just over the five. Very million. impressive. Wow. And, and it does show that South Africans are pretty much clued into what's happening in the crypto space. Christo, we're going to leave it there. Thanks very much for that. Very illuminating. And I think that the lesson there is uh, there are risks in transferring crypto and you need to take care on how you do that. And I, and I see that you have taken some some precautions to help your own customers make sure that they don't make the mistake that our reader did. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for listening to the MoneyWeb Crypto Podcast, hosted by Kieran Ryan. To listen to our other podcasts, go to moneyweb.co.za or the MoneyWeb app and follow MoneyWeb News for daily updates.